about in your earnings call, I think last week, 100 million new nights uh, last quarter. I think uh, uh, 1.1 million new nights per night or so, booked or, or a little bit more. Um, consolidation in the OT landscape has been one of the biggest, I think, themes or trends over the past uh, couple of years. The gulf now, right, between the number one and the number two and everybody else was right, so vast. So if you were, if you were the head of planning and strategy at, say, the, the fifth largest uh, OTA today, what would you be doing? Well, I think the fifth one's already being bought, isn't that right? <laughs> um, that's a good question. The first thing is, while that number sounded very big, that 1.1 million a day, that's really actually in terms of the total amount of hotels being booked around the world. It's actually small. And when you do something in terms of the total size of travel, and nobody really knows your numbers are probably as good as anyone's, but if we say travel is somewhere... I think they're actually a little bit better. But anyway, <laughs> if we say travel somewhere between a trillion and a trillion five around the world, and we only booked 50 million, 50 million last year, I mean, there's still so much room for everybody. That's the first thing. But if you are number five or even number 50, the question is, how are you going to compete? What are you going to do well? And I think what, what I've seen is a lot of the companies are doing the smart thing, which is partnering with somebody else who can do the things that you don't do well and establishing some sort of specialty that actually you do best. And that's really what we're seeing happening. I mean, you know, for example, uh, we partnered with Citrix, for example. Now, why did that happen? Well, we do some things extremely well that Citrix has does not have the expertise yet, and they do certain things that they do really well that we have not established as much of an expertise. So I think um, for anybody, it's knowing what are you good at and trying to perfect that. And don't try to do the things that you're not best at. So when you look at that 50 billion or whatever the number is, where is the opportunity? Is it in new markets, people coming online for the first time and in their first transaction, or is it those processes that are still offline, such as groups and business travel, corporate travel? So the question is, where's our growth going to come from? And you have to look at one international growth, number two new segments, such as groups and business. Well, I think there's, again, still tremendous opportunity in every single area of travel that we have a small portion of, and everyone else. I mean, uh, for example, we just announced uh, a few weeks ago that we have a thing called Booking.com for Business, Booking for Business, which is a special type of booking for companies who have uh, a lot of people traveling and they want to have some tools that Booking did not used to offer. Now we're going to offer these tools that are especially for the business traveler. That's an opportunity that we just started. So we have all of that still in front of us. Uh, as you probably also saw, we have a thing called Villas and Villa.com. This is for an area where, again, we didn't do that until fairly recently. So there's still a lot of area for us, and really we're still kind of our core market. That's an interesting question, actually, about uh, kind of Billis.com. It's been a big growth area, uh, vacation rentals. And uh, also there was uh, an allusion in the earnings call last week about kind of onboarding privately owned uh, homes, right, which is a bit of a shift in, uh, in strategy. But what's changed in that? in that space. What's different about, uh, about that market that, uh, where you weren't looking at that a few years ago that uh, now that's, that's different? Well, I think that we've all seen that there's a tremendous desire for people to have a variety of choice in where they're going to stay. Sometimes you want to stay at a big hotel. Sometimes you want a little boutique hotel. Sometimes you may actually want a house or a villa. We want to be able to offer our customers every single potential and do it in a way that makes them want to use us. We want them to feel that no matter what they want, we'll be able to offer them that best product. Well, but what are, there's a number of challenges there, though, that uh, everything needs to be instantly bookable. That's something that, you think that uh, has been kind of core to, uh, to the booking.com model. But that's uh, still a really big issue for, for that space. Even on the, uh, the leaders in that space, Airbnb and, and HomeAway, uh, still, uh, there is uh, often a wait period for a lot of their, their inventory. How are you going to address that with those individual homeowners? Yeah, it's a, it is a complicated thing because when you're dealing with uh, an individual owner, one of the first things, if I own a, a property and I want to rent it out, but it's my home, and I say, gee, I don't know, do I want to know the person first? Do I want to learn who he is or she is before I actually rent them? Do I have some communication with them first or not? Or am I just going to let uh, some third party, just you'd handle it for me. And it 
it's hard to say. Some people probably are not comfortable doing an instant booking and have no control over who's going to be in their home. Other people get comfortable. And I guess it really comes down to the trust you have with that third party agent. If that third party agent is able to verify this is a good person, they're not going to wreck your house. That makes a big difference than it's just somebody you never heard of. So one of the great things about our company, I think, is we've established a high level of trust with them. And we have to maintain that, obviously, all the way through to something like a bill Is that uh, something where you are going to uh, pursue those relationships directly with the, the individual uh, owner? Or is it uh, a partnership with, with HomeAway or, with, or potentially with Airbnb? Well, I think one of the things that's always important is never tell people in front of a large audience what you're going to do. There's not many people here. Yeah. This is a very lightly attended session. Right. Right. No one's interested in what you're going to do. Price line. Yeah, it's a small company. Um, here's the thing. We will continue to examine all the different ways that we can accomplish that goal, which is to provide the customer with the best experience. And if that means that somehow we have to partner, then maybe we will. If it means that we have to hire a lot more people to do it, maybe we'll do that. But we'll look and always try and do what's best for our customers. And customers, by the way, works both ways. Don't forget, our, the supplier is our customer, too. It's a two-sided market. We have to do right for both sides. So, talking about a product that may not always be bookable online, Booking Suite. What is the problem that you're solving with Booking Suite? What's the market? You know, is it small properties? You know, up to 20 rooms? Is it 50 rooms? Is it B and B's? Are you what? What are you targeting there? Okay. So Booking Suite is a service for hotels, and it's going to be a or is uh, more than one thing. It started out just providing uh, the ability to do a website, and it also enables a hotel they need to have they want to have an app out in, uh, in the mobile area. And now we recently acquired a company called PriceMap to help provide some business intelligence. Again, this goes back to what I said earlier about specialization. If a hotel, for example, doesn't have a, a large number of IT professionals, but honestly, they have to have a website. The question is, how are they going to get that? Are they going to hire a big ad agency to build it at maybe 40,000 pounds? Are they going to hire their cousin, who the chief was probably going to be really bad? So we thought, here's a service. We're pretty good at websites. Let's do that and do it at a fair price. Then we said, well, gee, you know, mobile is really big, but if you're a small player, you may not be able to afford what it's going to cost to keep updating all those apps all the time. And you have to do it for more than one platform. You've got to do it for iOS. You've got to do it for Android. So we said, well, gee, we're pretty good at that, too. We can do that better than anyone else can do it. We can do it because of our scale at a cheaper price. Now you say small or large. There's some very, very large players that I won't mention who think it's much better to have us do this work for them than for them to do it themselves. And you say, why do they do that? Again, it's simple specialization. If we can do it better, cheaper, then they can do it on their own and do it in a way that will produce more revenue for them, they will use it. So you're already doing it. You're already, but is there an issue where hotels just feel like I'm putting too many eggs in that booking basket? Well, there are some hotels who think that, or at least they're right about it. Well, I, 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 you know, you'd have to ask them why they think that. Um, obviously, we always want to do what we think is best for our clients. Um, if somebody felt that they don't want to use us simply because we're good at what we do, I mean, that's a little bit odd. But, but There's still a lot of skepticism from the smaller properties, right? They still, they still don't feel like they're always in control of their inventory, always in control of the channel decisions. And there's still that, that issue of, you know, am I, am I just, am I giving away too much? Isn't it one of the benefits of I mean, you used to be uh, number four, number five, now you're number one, you're the 800 pound gorilla. Expedia used to get beaten up a bit. I mean, that's one of the fringe benefits, right, of, of being so good at what you do. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely press I read occasionally, and it does say some things that, um, that you're talking about. I, I wonder how much of it is uh, the loud and obnoxious voice is the one that gets you know, the press. I do know that we have over 600,000 partners 600,000 accommodations, okay? If we did a bad job, they didn't like us, they wouldn't be with us. They're with us for a reason, and that's because we provide a good service to them. Um, there is no doubt there are going to be some people who are going to have that fear that you mentioned. I mean, 
Let's face it. I, I, the question was asked earlier, Peter, what, what keeps you up at night, right? Well, anybody who runs a business is always concerned about all different things. And one of the things will be your partners. Are they going to continue to be good partners? Or if I give someone a lot of my business, what happens if they turn to not being so nice? That's understandable. That's human beings. So we have to continue day after day, prove that we are a partner and not do something that would then make them feel that you're not a partner, you're stepping on my neck. You know, Peter also mentioned actually Amazon is one of the companies that does keep him up at night. There's been a lot of uh, speculation in media about Amazon moving into travel potentially in a pretty big way. Does, does Amazon keep you up at night? You know, I'll go back to what I just said. There are a lot of things that keep anybody who's running, helping to run a business, anybody on a team. And Peter's absolutely right. How can you not recognize the incredible expertise, the scale, the number of customers, the amount of money that Amazon has? On the other hand, though, they've done, they've, they've made a couple of forays into the travel business before. And, you know, those weren't so successful. Maybe if they want to push forward, maybe they will be. I don't know. I can't predict what they're going to do. I will say there are a lot of very, very big players out in the space who talk about coming into travel or are in travel. And you know, when people say something, you just mentioned, well, you're the 800 pound gorilla, and you're the person people are looking to, you know, bananas, maybe at it. And I think, God, I don't feel that way at all. I feel there's Alibaba, which is a 200 something, you know, 200 something billion dollar market cap, cash flow out the kazoo, and they just created Ali Travel. And then you go on to, well, Google, seem to be doing some things to travel too, and they're a lot bigger. And then you have all the other players who are so much bigger, so much more powerful. So I'm, I'm concerned about all of them and a lot more, but you can't do anything about your competitive. You can't change what they're going to do. All you can do is what you're going to do. And one of our founders of Booking.com, Case Coolin, he used to say this, and I, it was so wonderful. He says, I don't pay too much attention to what other people are doing. I spend my time working on what we're doing. Do you need to get into more, diversify more into the experience selling and you know, number one, number two, activities, tours, packages? And there's so much that, that range of product that's not directly associated with booking.com. Yeah, or, or any of our other yeah, restaurants. Well, yeah, I mean, that's restaurants. exactly. We had an open table. Now, let, look, our group has a, a number of different brands and everything from open table, which is restaurant reservations, kayak is meta. Service OTA and Priceline.com that does everything. We have our hotels and go to and booking, and we have rentalcars.com also. And the question you're asking is, well, what are you going to do next? What other areas should you go into? And that's something that we look at all the time and we test. We've tested with a lot of things, and if something really catches on, we will push forward as hard as we can on that. Um, there's nothing that it says that we, well, that's not our business, we won't go into that. There's nothing that, what we do is what I think anything you read about are the best. Executives and, and you know Steve Jobs. What you do is you experiment, and what works you'll push forward. And I, I look forward to some of the things I hope will work down the road that we're testing right now. And most of them probably won't. But you gotta just keep on throwing stuff against the wall, and see what sticks. There's been a lot of discussion about about the experience and OTAs pushing kind of further into the, the funnel. But if you think about you know, the future and or maybe some of the big problems or frictions in the travel experience today. Look, hotel shopping and booking is pretty much, it's, it's a pretty nice experience, certainly a lot better than it was uh, 10 or 15 years ago. But what are some of those frictions in the experience now? What are some things that, that, that are interesting to you, problems that, that uh, could be tackled? Well, um, there, there are a number, and, and most of them, and our company actually, these are things we can't do. And I'll, I'll go for number one right off the bat, and that is, the amount of time it goes through in certain countries through immigration is just criminal. I mean, everybody talks about tourism is the biggest industry, travel is the biggest industry in the world, and governments have whole departments. You know, you have ministries of tourism, and yet to have to go and get a visa for some countries, or even you don't have to have a visa, you have to go to the airport, you go on a 12-hour flight, you show up at the immigration, the line is an hour out. It's just absurd that technology can quickly change that. Of course, it's government, so obviously it's a little slow. But can, can OTAs change that? No, of course not. So governments have a monopoly on that part. Okay. There's no competition for immigration. Um, so that's one way of that. 
and they go for anything else when you look at points of friction. And maybe some of the stuff we can uh, help out, and I've seen some other companies that are working on that. And how many times, and, and this, how many of you have been to Las Vegas, and many of the hotels there which are incredibly as fun as can be, and lots of you want to go there, and because some of you want to go there, sometimes, depending on the time of day, the line to check in at the hotel can be forever. And you're wondering, what are they doing back there? They have all the information from the booking. Why does this take so long? And then you think, well, wait, why do I even need to get a key? I have a phone. Maybe I have a better C chip. I said, well, chip has to be a little lock. And there are companies working on those sort of things. So I think there are a tremendous amount of points of friction. Still, we say, oh, it's really, really good right now. I think a lot of ways can get even better. Some of the things we'll be able to participate and help some of the stuff that's beyond our control. So if we just all well, kind of connect the dots, right, between say that and there's a really interesting and really big problem and you know, some of the investments that you've made, like in, uh, uh, in the booking suite uh, acquisitions, you know, being able to uh, uh, reach in deeper within that, that reservation to provide some of that support, right, beyond the booking and into the experience, is that exactly? And here's the point about that. Again, it comes down to most hotels probably don't have the capital, they probably don't have the expertise, they can't hire people to help make those trials. But if we are able to do that development and spread that across many different hotels, it'll be good for us, it'll be good for them, and even more so, it'll be good for the traveler. Because that's the important thing. Can I try to connect one more dot? <laughs> Just on that. So within the booking suite, there's also a really interesting acquisition that uh, got some coverage, but I don't think the Priceline group made, made much noise about it, but it was Rocket Miles, which we are really interesting kind of loyalty uh, 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 play uh, based in, in the U.S. Is there a, now, and Priceline also is the one you know, big OTA that doesn't have a loyalty or a rewards program. Is there a, a tie-in with Rocket Miles and, and, and Booking Suites, and am I going to be able to uh, use my hotel points to, to against a restaurant reservation, an open table. I mean, this is what analysts like to do. We like to connect all these dots. Sure, right, that one, that one, that one. <laughs> um, so Rocket Miles is a company based in Chicago. It's very, very small, but the guys there are just super in love. Um, their model is they will book a hotel room for you, and you'll get frequent flyer miles for that stay beyond what you normally would get, and it's airline miles right now. Um, that is oriented towards a very, very uh, special niche, and that's the people who care about miles a lot. Most people don't care that much about the frequent flyer miles, because most people don't travel enough to develop enough miles that they actually use them, etc. But certainly, there is a select group, and uh, the term is uh, mileage junkies. And of course, mileage is, rocket miles, I told them, I said, gee, that may be good for the U.S., but can we, do we have rocket kilometers or not, because I don't know how well rocket miles can work outside the U.S. Um, it's small, it's good, we'll see how, we'll see what happens. Again, it goes back to the experiment, didn't cost a lot of money, I love the team, come on, let's see what they can do. Is there a trend or a development or a company, maybe someone here today that has surprised you over the last couple of years? We don't have enough time to go through every single Something company. Something you said, that I, that I, what's the say. one thing you said, I wish I saw that coming? Oh you? God, there's so many like that. Well, I'll give a couple, two, I'll give two. Um, the first one is the whole orientation of uh, using your app to get a taxi. The Ubers, to get taxis, the Lyfts, all that. Because when I first heard about it, I first heard about it and said, what? what? What's the big deal about that? You just, I, right now, if I need a black car service from work, I pick up my phone and call. What's the, what's the big deal? I just totally, because I hadn't seen the product. I hadn't seen all the things it was going to do. And that just, obviously, once you used it once, or just saw the actual product, you're like, wow. Of course, this is fantastic. The second thing that I also, I, I didn't, it wasn't shown to me at all until it was already out in the marketplace, uh, was Airbnb. But if somebody had brought the pitch to me and said, we're going to create this platform where people are going to rent out their couches and their uh, living rooms and we'll let strangers come in and stay at our place and we'll get paid for it, and, and what do you think of that? And I say, I don't know about that. And I think, and then I think, well, they say, well, why? And here's what I come up with. I'd say, well, I get a little concerned about security and safety because I don't know whose place that is. And if I had the place that I don't know the person going to stay, I don't know if I want to be an axe murderer. Now, sometimes bad things happen in hotels too. I mean, you know, I'd be in charge of the IMF, perhaps, and you know, that happens. Nothing, nothing bad ever happens. No, 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 right, exactly. But 
the, the, that was one. The second thing that would have hit me would be, well, what about regulations? I mean, won't, first of all, won't the cities, the government say, well, that's not legal. You, we have reasons and rules about this. You, this is a hotel, or this is a residential place. And, but we have read, it's not, we don't do it because it's just, we feel like having rules. The rules are there for a reason. So the other nine people on the floor who own apartments are not being barraged with all these people coming home at one o'clock in the morning drinking and all that. So I thought, gee, that's gonna stop it too. And then I said, the third thing would have come up, and if that, the city governments don't do it, the hotels will start lobbying and say, you gotta stop this because we have to pay taxes. We have to adhere to fire and safety uh, regulations. How come these other guys are getting a free ride on this? So all those things, I would have said, thank you very much for visiting, but I'm not going to give you any money. And I would have been $20 billion wrong. I think it's, it's pretty good. I, I totally agree. And I think any, many of us didn't see it coming. What about, um, what about Facebook? It's probably signed notoriously. It's not been a huge fan of social media. Is he, are you surprised that Facebook's becoming more and more relevant well, to the travel industry? You've got some pretty famous, this is a, some, some good quotes you've had in the past, calling all uh, social media experts charlatans, or I think from, from a conference from a few years ago. Do you, Still feel the same way? You know, I looked that up on fear that you may ask me about. <laughs> it was over four years ago. And actually the statement was regarding people who put themselves out as consultants who were expert in social media and would help you be able to get a great ROI on your advertising on social media. And my point about that was suggesting to anybody, if somebody, if somebody approaches you and wants to give you that service, you may be want to be a little cautious, that may not be the best use of your marketing money, handing over so many things are an expert in the area that had just begun. That was the statement. That being said, we are friendly, we're very friendly with Facebook, we are working very closely together. In fact, we're working very closely with every single social media platform there is. The correct statement though is, 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 is are any of the social media platforms going to give someone the same ROI that you get out of other advertising and the answer is so far, in my opinion, I have not seen as good a result. Will that change? I hope so. I think everybody who has any, any part of advertising would love to have more ways you can actually spend at a high positive ROI than less. Who wouldn't want that? Everybody wants that. Um, we'll continue to work with these different social media platforms to try and help them create the right way to get that high ROI. There are some sectors that uh, we've talked about that, that maybe you, uh, you've been overlooked or surprised by. What are some sectors or areas, say, within the startup uh, world that maybe are getting a lot of funding or a lot of attention? Maybe they're overinvested. There's more, more hype than substance there. Well, I, I won't pick out an individual one, but I'll talk about a general statement that um, came out a couple months ago. Uh, there's a very famous uh, VC guy. His name is Bill Gurr. Great guy. And he said something uh, at a conference, I believe, and he used the term FOMO, fear of missing out. And he was describing why are valuations what they are? Why are they so high? Why are people willing to spend the good money at these incredible lofty levels? And I think his reasoning is right because you have a lot of money, too much money, some would say, too much capital flowing in. And people who have that money, the general partners, have their obligation to invest that. They told they got the money from the limited market, they're going to invest it. So when you have that situation, it one builds on the other one. So everybody feels, well, it, maybe it's a little bit, I don't know, maybe it's a little bit during the time before the uh, financial crisis when the, the CEO of, City, of Citibank said, yeah, you have to keep dancing when the music's playing. Yeah. And the music I, is playing. The music's playing. <laughs> exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Sorrell.